Good evening, and welcome to a conversation about the proposed Dundas Bus Rapid Transit Mississauga East project. My name is Joseph Thornley. I'm the CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for online consultation, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's uh, conversation. One important note, if you would like to turn on closed captioning, you can do that by scrolling, uh, by moving your mouse to the bottom of the video window and just clicking on the CC uh, symbol, and that'll turn on closed captioning. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In fact, the Dundas Bus Rapid Transit Project is proposed on lands covered by Treaty 3, 1792, the Head of the Lake Purchase 1806, and the Brant Tract, 1795, Treaty 22 and 23. 1820 and Treaty 13, 1805 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the Fort Albany Nonfin Treaty of 1701 with the Haudenosaunee. Metrolinx is committed to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and to working towards meaningful recognition or reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. Now, tonight's live session is part of the third round of public engagement for the Dundas BRT project. The purpose of the Dundas BRT project is to evaluate the proposed transit corridor along a 48 kilometer stretch of Dundas Street from Highway 6 in the city of Hamilton through to the Kipling Transit Hub in the city of Toronto, linking Etobicoke and Mississauga city centers. This round of engagement is focused on the Mississauga East segment of the project between Etobicoke Creek and Confederation Parkway. We've scheduled this session to last one hour. There will be a brief presentation and then we'll take as many questions as possible. As you'll see, some people have already asked questions. You can scroll down to the bottom of your screen below the list of speakers and you'll see a question submission area. You can upvote uh, the questions that have already been posed if you'd like to hear them answered live tonight. And if you don't see your interest addressed, you can add a question during the session as you listen to the presentation. And we'll, uh, we'll make an effort to go through the questions afterwards and uh, in the order in which uh, they've been voted. So I'd now like to introduce our panel. Um, Joseph Ehrlich is the manager, project planning for Metrolinx. Darcy Wilshire, also from Metrolinx, is the Environmental Project Manager. Greg Medellin, Director of Community Engagement for Metrolinx. And with them is Anne-Marie Chung, Rapid Transit Sponsor for Metrolinx. And Matthew Williams is here tonight, the Project Leader from the City of Mississauga. We also have two representatives of ACOM, Kevin Phillips, who is the Project Manager, and Andrew Barr, the Deputy Project Manager for ACOM. In addition to these expert panelists, there are also a number of staff who are on hand, uh, not on camera right now, but they're here and they can support the question and answers. So to kick things off, I'd like to call on Joseph Ehrlich of Metrolinx Planning to provide us with some additional context on the project. Joseph? Thank you, Joseph. Um, so. Welcome again to the Dundas Bus Rapid Transit Mississauga East Project Live meeting. My name is Joseph Ehrlich and I am the Manager of Project Planning at Metrolinx. As you may remember from past meetings, Metrolinx in partnership with the City of Mississauga is planning for Dundas BRT. The purpose of the Dundas BRT is to evaluate the uh, 48 kilometer uh, proposed transit corridor that Joseph had talked about. Um, and it contains four segments, including a segment in Toronto, the Mississauga East segment, which is the purpose of tonight's meeting, the Mississauga West segment, and a segment in Halton Region and Hamilton. 
The seven kilometer priority Mississauga East segment between Etobicoke Korean Confederation Parkway is advancing through analysis and approvals ahead of other sections to support the city of Mississauga's investing in Canada infrastructure program application. The transit project assessment process has been initiated for the segment with a target completion in late April 2022. With that, I would like to turn it over to our technical advisory team, AECOM, so Andrew Barr and Kevin Phillips, to walk you through the progress made to date. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Joseph, and for um, some, some of the background and purpose on, on the project uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Uh, the purpose of this engagement is to provide an update of what we heard at the last round of engagement and how it's been incorporated in the project. We want to provide an update on the Mississauga East Transit Project Assessment Process, and you'll hear me refer to that as TPAP. Uh, we'll provide an update including uh, uh, the notice of commencement and the upcoming 30-day public review process. We'll share some findings, potential impacts, and proposed mitigations presented within our draft environmental project report, which you'll hear is referred to as the EPR sometimes, and uh, we want to request feedback on what's been incorporated into the EPR. We'll present some optimized designs and show how impacts have been addressed or reduced based on uh, some of the considerations we've heard from our environmental specialists, uh, spe specifically with the Cooksville pinch point and for the remainder of the Mississauga East section. And we'll discuss the next steps for the Mississauga East uh, segment of the project as well as the overall project. This engagement is focused on Mississauga East though, which has been advanced the most to support the preliminary design and the environmental studies of the, the area. The city's federal infrastructure, investing in Canada infrastructure program funding application and implementation requirements. And it's also to meet the city's official plan aspirations and the provincial growth plan. Engagement for Toronto, Mississauga West, and also the Hamilton Halton segments will continue throughout 2022, 2022 in the future. Next slide, please. As you may recall, if you're at prior engagements, the, the, the project study area has been divided into four segments, generally defined by municipal geography and by the extent of planning work that's already been put in place for transit improvements in the area. From east to west, the first is the City of Toronto from the Kipling Transit Hub to Etobicoke Creek. Next is Mississauga area. However, Mississauga has been split into two segments, Mississauga East and Mississauga West. Mississauga East is, again, the focus of today's engagement and extends from Etobicoke Creek through to uh, Confederation Parkway. And again, we've advanced this because of the application to the federal government for ICIB funding in order to support the advanced near-term implementation of the BRT in this corridor. The other Mississauga segment is Mississauga West, which is from Confederation Parkway through to Ninth Line at the Oakville border. border. And finally, the last segment, which is Hamilton and the Halton region area, which has gone through its own planning process already. Next slide, please. There are three major elements to our project. The first one is that TPAP that I mentioned. That's an expedited environmental assessment process that is required for all public transit projects in Ontario. This involves a pre-consultation phase as well as an up to a 120-day TPAP phase in which the environmental impacts are available for public review, and we're actually in that process right now. The other two key notable project structure elements include the preparation of a preliminary design of the corridor improvements, as well as a preliminary design business case, which evaluates the project for strategic, economic, financial, and operations deliverability cases. It also sets out the costs, the benefits, and the risks associated with the project. Next slide. Project timeline. This graphic summarizes the, the general process, and we're currently at public engagement round number three, as you've heard, and the TPAP consultation documentation period. segment, and that's expected to be completed by the spring of 2022. In parallel with that, we are completing the preliminary design of the corridor from Mississauga East, which is expected to be completed by late this winter. 
Since the last engagement, our schedule has been slightly revised to allow for greater time to complete the development and assessment of transit service options, as well as the preliminary design business case I was just talking about. And this is for the areas outside of the Mississauga East segment. So for both the Toronto and the Mississauga West segments, the alternative designs and assessment will now occur in summer of 2022. And the presentation of the best performing alternatives, the impacts and mitigation measures for public review as part of that TPAT process will now be in the fall of 2022 for those segments, Mississauga West and Toronto. Overall, the study is expected to complete in early 2023. Next slide. Public engagement and consultation is really important to us. And And engagements, Toronto, Missouri West, and Halton will include conservatives, stop locations and amenities that are at those stops, details on the transit routing and service plan, as well as environmental impacts and mitigation measures. And that's all expected to be presented in summer, fall 2022, and subsequently after that in winter 2022. Next slide. Public engagement number two, which was held last September, provided updates for all segments in the corridor and presented existing conditions for Toronto, Mississauga East and Mississauga West. It presented alternatives for the Cooksville and Arendelle pinch point alternatives and I identified the best performing alternative for the Cooksville pinch point, which you're going to hear more about today. Feedback was requested on all of those topics I just mentioned feedback that we got at that second round was very similar to the feedback we got at the first round of engagement. It demonstrated that uh, there was general public support for the project and improving transit. Uh, there was also feedback that helped inform the development of our corridor design, including the following, expanding improving cycling facilities, providing reliable transit service, adding more stops, uh, providing transit connections to other transit services and maintaining traffic flow. But we did hear some concerns raised about noise and vibration impacts, impacts to properties, construction and operations impacts to the community and to the environment, impacts to traffic and preservation of the community character as well. Next slide. We uh, continue to engage with the public as we are today, as well as stakeholder groups and subject matter experts through our technical advisory committee called the TAC, as well as a stakeholder advisory group, SAG. Next slide. Mississauga East segment is now within the TPAP with a notice of commencement issued on December 10th. To support the TPAP, a number of environmental studies as listed here on this slide have been completed to document the existing conditions and any potential impacts. Uh, since then, potential impacts have also been identified and mitigation measures have been proposed. These impacts are being used by the design team to further refine our design to either reduce or eliminate these potential impacts. The environmental studies that are shown here have formed the basis of the Mississauga draft EPR, uh, that environmental project report that I mentioned. And that draft EPR has been sent to agencies as well as the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks for their review and comment. Our EPR will then be made for public review and comment in February, starting on February 23rd to March 24th for public review. Next slide. This is uh, just a general lay of the Mississauga East project area, extending from the Etobicoke Creek at the City of Toronto border all the way to Confederation Parkway in the west. Next slide. Uh, as part of the TPAC process, it is legislated that the project consider matters of provincial importance, which are no noted here, Indigenous relations, the natural environment, as well as cultural heritage and archaeology. Next slide. Uh, natural environment field investigations observed a number of species in the corridor, the most notable being two bird species at risk under the Etobicoke Creek Bridge. Now, in order to address any potential natural environment impacts, proposed mitigation measures include vegetation removal prior to bird nesting periods, bird netting to prevent the nesting on the structures, tree protection, of course, and avoiding construction at structures during nesting, nesting periods. Next slide. A comprehensive tree inventory was done. We identified more than 1,500 trees, of which there were seven notable species, but no species at risk were identified. Potential impacts uh, include vegetation disturbance and removal for construction, but where possible, as I noted before, tree protection will be provided. Next slide. 
a socioeconomic and land use characteristic study uh, found a number of community amenities within the area, especially clustered around the Cooksville area. Um, throughout the corridor, there's commercial and residential development, schools, long-term care, daycares, shopping centers and opportunities, as well as uh, places of worship, just to name a few. Next slide. In order to address impacts to these amenities I just mentioned, there's a number of mitigation strategies that have been identified. These including developing management plans to control nuisance effects such as construction dust, noise, or vibration, developing an access management plan to minimize impacts and manage access to properties, regular monitoring to ensure that the impacts remain within acceptable levels and are consistent with municipal bylaw and other policy requirements, minimizing property impacts through design refinement, refinement sorry, and developing a traffic and uh, uh, pedestrian management plan, including detours. Next slide. Our cultural heritage specialist conducted a thorough review of the quarter to identify known and potential built heritage resources and cultural heritage landscapes. The majority of the known and potential locations are within the Cooksville area, although there are, there's a cluster as well between Cothra and Tompkin Road. Um, through this process, we, uh, and in accordance with the TPAP, Indigenous nations have been consulted and will continue to be in, engaged in the cultural heritage studies. And let's go to the next slide and look at some of the mitigation strategies. Here we are. So in order to address potential impacts to heritage features, we will conduct additional cultural heritage evaluation reports to determine properties actual heritage value. And during our design process, we'll plan to minimize or avoid adverse effects to these pro properties. We'll conduct pre and post construction condition surveys, as well as do active monitoring during construction to assess and, and mitigate vibration effects during uh, that construction. Next slide. Our, our noise and vibration assessment study identified 27 receptors within the construction vibration zone of influence and 23 within the construction noise zone, zone of influence. So we've identified a number of strategies for this, and this includes developing a noise management plan for construction, doing a, a vibration management plan for construction, uh, constructing noise attenuation barriers at select locations, and completing regular maintenance of our transit fleet vehicles to make sure they're in good working order during operation. Next slide. Uh, we did a, a stage one archaeological assessment throughout the quarter to determine the potential for disturbances to archaeological resources and artifacts. And in order to address any potential disturbances, mitigation for this would include con conducting, of course, additional study prior to any excavation. So this would be a stage two archeological assessment. Uh, and if any archeological resources are uh, identified and encountered during construction, all work would be suspended. Uh, the site would be protected uh, from any further impact and additional assessment would be undertaken. And as I noted before, for cultural heritage, indigenous nations through our archaeological studies will continue to be engaged in the future as well. Next slide. Climate change is everyone's concern, as such it is for the city and for Metrolinx. The Dundas BRT transit improvements will encourage more sustainable transportation choices and will help create a community that is less dependent on the single occupant vehicle. This is done by increasing transit rider ridership by providing that more reliable uh, frequent transit service that Joseph mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it'll provide connections to local and express transit services. It'll provide enhanced uh, active transportation facilities, including dedicated cycling facilities and wider sidewalks. In, additions, uh, in addition, we're also considering uh, future electrification technology, uh, which when in service will help meet the province's greenhouse gas emission target reductions. Reduction targets. <laughs> All right, next slide. The Dundas Street corridor through Mississauga East varies from four to six lanes with sidewalks on both sides. There are currently no dedicated cycling facilities through the study area, but as I just mentioned before, the project does plan to introduce dedicated protected cycling facilities throughout the project limits. There are traffic impacts though during construction and proposed mitigation strategies for that include implementation of a comprehensive traffic and transit management plan, which would provide adequate temporary detour signage. And 
and this signage would be for traffic, pedestrians, and cyclists in the area. We'll maintain existing and pedest existing pedestrian and cyclist residential property access through the work zones wherever and whenever possible. And we'll coordinate with emergency service providers and transit service providers to ensure that service disruptions are limited during construction. Next slide. During operation of the BRT, left turn movements will be restricted to major signalized intersections due to the presence of a, a raised median that separates the BRT lanes from the general purpose traffic lanes. This graphic here on this slide illustrates how the signalized intersections would allow vehicles to access the side streets and the entrances along the corridor. This restriction in traffic impact will be mitigated by the introduction of extended left turn signal times to accommodate the greater volume of left turn and U-turn traffic at these signalized intersections. Also at the, the intersections, we'll include longer pedestrian clearance times so that the pedestrians have greater crossing time and a safer crossing experience uh, across the widened intersections. And these in intersections will also include transit signal priority or a better name for that is, or an easier name is smart signals. And this will help improve the BRT bus flows through the corridor. Next slide. This slide illustrates the potential travel time savings by a variety of modes, local buses, autos, and the BRT. With the introduction of the BRT service through Mississauga East, a travel time savings of up to 20 minutes is forecast in comparison to local buses, and a nine minute savings when compared to general auto traffic. These times are based on the PM peak hour, so the critical period during the traveling day. It should be noted that the general purpose traffic capacity of two lanes per direction will be maintained through the quarter. However, that existing six lane section, including the HOV uh, east of Dixie Road through Toronto will be reallocated for the median BRT lanes and guideway. Next slide. Air quality. Uh, existing air quality levels are generally better than the target thresholds in the uh, for the corridor, with the exception of a few contaminants noted here at the top. Uh, these chemicals that you see here are generally related to fossil fuel combustion in the area. Proposed mitigation measures for that include management of construction vehicle activity to con control emissions, developing an air quality management plan, transitioning from fossil fuel combustion uh, for transit vehicles to electric vehicles and introducing carbon capturing vegetation within the study area. So street trees and other plantings in the area. Next slide. The next steps for the Mississauga East TPAP uh, include continued refinement and development of the preliminary design and the EPR report based on feedback received. Well, upon completion of the consultation documentation period, we will issue the notice of completion in February 2022. And upon the issuance of that notice, we'll kick off the 30 day public review period and then that 35 day minister's review period I mentioned earlier. After that, we'll issue the statement of completion and then finally share the final EPR report during a fifth round of engagement tentatively scheduled for the winter of 2022. The next steps for the Toronto segment and the Mississauga West segment following this round of engagement include evaluating the Arendelle pinch point alternatives based on the feedback received during the second round of engagement last September, developing infrastructure design alternatives for Toronto, uh, identifying the best performing design, including stop locations within Toronto and Mississauga West. And during the fourth round of engagement tentatively scheduled for the summer or fall of 2022, we will present the best performing alternative for the Arendelle pinch point, as well as the stop locations within both Toronto and Mississauga West. Then we will initiate the TPAP process for those two segments, Mississauga West and Toronto, in the fall of 2022, and connect with the public again during a fifth round of engagement tentatively scheduled for the winter of 2022. With that, I'm going to hand off now to Andrew, our design and civil lead for the remaining sections. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, over the next few slides, I'll present the progress that the project team has made on the BRT corridor design within the Mississauga East segment. And this is uh, extending from Etobicoke Creek to Jaguar Valley and is known as a, the outside pinch point area. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
As a reminder, the corridor through this area is constrained by an existing uh, right of way or roadway width of between 36 and 40 meters, which has presented challenges given the desired cross section is up to 42 meters. The desired cross section includes dedicated median BRT lanes with raised medians, two general purpose traffic lanes per direction, and enhanced boulevards with dedicated protected cycle tracks, a furniture tree planting pole zone, and widened sidewalks. Since the last engagement, the 10% preliminary design for the BRT corridor has been further refined based on feedback provided by the public and other stakeholders. In addition, our technical and environmental specialists identified potential impacts of which the following were most notable. Heritage and non-heritage property impacts, increased noise and vibration, both during construction and operations, pedestrian and cyclist safety, and construction costs, including property acquisition costs. In order to address these impacts, as well as the feedback provided during the previous engagements, a number of mitigation strategies have been adopted. These include optimization of the corridor alignment to minimize impacts to properties, this is mindfully locating the, the alignment through the corridor either to the north or to the south to limit or minimize the impacts. Secondly, reductions in the boulevard space um, at select locations such as a reduction in the furniture and pole zones to a minimum 0 0.6 meter width, a minimum sidewalk, sidewalk width of 1.5 meters, and consolidation of the sidewalk and cycle track to a single MUP or multi-use path. And finally, a reduced through traffic lane width of 3.35 meters at select locations was applied. An illustration of this refined cross-section will be shown shortly. Next slide. The project team has continued coordination with two ongoing MIST Saga specially, special policy area studies. Since the last round of engagement, a short list of con conceptual designs for the replacement of the Little Etobicoke Creek crossing structure has been developed. Hydraulic analyses for the Etobicoke Creek crossing have been confirmed or has confirmed that the existing structure has sufficient capacity. The project team will now be developing the 30% preliminary design for replacement of these structures based on the Dundas BRT and the special policy area studies needs. Next slide. This slide illustrates two typical cross sections along the corridor outside of the Cooksville pinch point area. The one on the left is a cross section along Dundas Street at its intersection with Dixie Road. The one on the right, a cross section generally through the balance of the area outside of the Cooksville pinch point. In both illustrations, you can see the dedicated BRT guideway in the middle of Dundas Street Physical barriers or medians precluding uh, the crossing, precluding crossing and left turning traffic, except at signalized intersections. Two general purpose traffic lanes in each direction, protected cycle tracks, the furniture tree planting and pole zones, and wider sidewalks. Since the last round of engagement, 4.2 meter wide median uh, platforms have been provided. This is a change from the previous 3.6 meter wide platforms previously shown. Next slide. Presented on this slide is a snapshot of the 10% preliminary design role plan, which is available for viewing on the Metrolinks Engage website. Next slide. As discussed earlier, the Mississauga East segment contains a constrained area referred to as a pinch point, which is through the Cooksville community, community from Confederation Parkway to Jaguar Valley Drive. As presented during previous engagements, the key considerations through this area is that, an existing, that it has an existing uh, narrow right-of-way or roadway width, which is as narrow as 23 meters, there are many buildings located close to the property line. There is significant development intensification proposed for the area. The new LRT, uh, here Ontario LRT and its station stops. And finally, cultural heritage resources within the area. Next slide. 
During the last round of public engagement, six alternative design concepts in the Cooksville Pinchpoint area were presented, which had varied operational benefits, construction complexity, impacts, and cost. Evaluation of these six Pinchpoint alternatives was based on a number of environmental studies and considered technical categories pertaining to the natural, cultural, and built uh, environment in the area. Based on our technical evaluation, Alternative 1 with the dedicated BRT with widening developed about the center line of Dundas Street was noted as the best performing alternative. And this is for the following reasons. It is the best for mobility and traffic considerations since it provides the dedicated BRT and has the least impacts to auto traffic. It provides the full balanced multimodal corridor for all users and with a, construct, with a moderate construction cost. And despite some cultural heritage impacts with this alternative, it has similar property impacts to the other shortlisted alternatives. Next slide. Despite Alternative 1 having natural and cultural heritage impacts and impacts to existing and future land uses in Cooksville, Alternative 1 with the dedicated median BRT guideway improves bus travel times through the Cooksville area and ensures BRT vehicles consistently remain on schedule with predictable travel times and higher service reliability. It also provides a direct connection to the future Here Ontario LRT. The rendering shown here on this slide provides an illustration of the proposed BRT corridor and what a station could potentially look like. However, I would like to note that this is a concept and will be subject to refinements and changes as the design progresses. Next slide. This slide illustrates two typical cross sections along the corridor through the Cooksville area. The one on the left is a cross-section along Dundas Street at its intersection with here Ontario Street. The one on the right, a cross-section generally through the balance of the Cooksville pinch point. With both illustrations, you can see the dedicated BRT guideway in the middle of the street, medians, two general purpose traffic lanes, protected cycle tracks, pole zones, and wider sidewalks. The potential impacts identified through the Cooksville area include property impacts, noise and vibration, pedestrian and cyclist safety, and construction and property costs. Mitigation, uh, mitigation design strategies similar to those adopted in the area outside the pinch point have been employed, including optimization of the corridor alignment again, reduced pole zone to 0 0.6 meters, minimum sidewalks applied, minimum sidewalk widths applied, consolidation of the sidewalk and cycle track to a single multi-use path, and a reduction in the through traffic lane of 3.35 meters through the entire limits of the Cooksville pinch point. Next slide. And similar to the area outside of the Cooksville pinch point, the 10% preliminary design role plans are available for viewing on the Metrolinx Engage website. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Kevin over to you. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, could, could we go back a slide, please? All right. Thank you. Uh, so what's next? The best uh, performing alternative, as you just heard from Andrew, for the Cooksville pinch point and the outside pinch point area will be carried forward to 30% preliminary design. Uh, this stage will include BRT stop conceptual designs with finalization of the geometry and the locating of amenities at those stops, streetscaping and public realm design, including cycling facilities, bridging culvert redesigns uh, for replacements, intersection and entrance designs, and development of transitions between the Mississauga East segment and the adjoining segments. And up upon finalization of these designs, utility and property impacts will be updated as well. Next slide. Excellent. The next round of public engagement is planned for the summer or the fall of 2022, and that will include the Toronto and Mississauga West segments. The project team will continue to incorporate feedback from previous engagements, including this one today, uh, into the Mississauga East DPR and the preliminary design. Environmental studies and preparation for the Toronto and Mississauga West TPAPs will continue and the transit routing and service plan study will be developed and additional traffic modeling will also be completed. The project team will 
uh, prepare the preferred design and develop stop locations for the Hamilton and Halton segments as well. Next slide. And then with that, I can hand it over to you, Joseph. Okay, well, thank you very much. You covered a huge amount of ground. And during the course of your presentation, some questions came in. So we have about 25 minutes now for questions. Uh, if you are watching us online, it's not too late to submit a question using the question form or to vote uh, for the questions that you want asked uh, first. So with that, uh, let's go to the question that was uh, submitted before the meeting and had a number of votes. Why not use the minimum 3.35 meter traffic lane width throughout? Uh, it's not being increasingly considered. It's now, sorry, being uh, uh, increasingly considered best practice to minis minimize the width of general purpose traffic lanes in order to limit traffic speed by design rather than posted speed limits and create a safer and more welcoming environment for pedestrians and cyclists. So could you talk a bit about uh, using a narrower wing, uh, lane width as uh, a natural traffic calming measure? Yeah. I I can take that one, Joseph. Um, so so uh, the corridor has been designed based on the design standards that are applicable for the municipality or jurisdiction in which the project uh, will be constructed and will eventually operate within. And of course, within Mississauga East, that would be the city of Mississauga. Um, the city of Mississauga um, does have um, standards in place of which uh, the minimum lane width standard is 3.5 meters. Um, and so, so that has been applied throughout the corridor. However, there are locations where we are applying the 3.35 meter um, through lane width. Um, um, and this is to just mitigate and eliminate some of the, the, the impacts to the properties where we may have significant property impact or even building displacements. Um, and, um, but, you know, recognizing that, yeah, some municipalities do have, you know, uh, lane widths of 3.35 meters as their minimum standards. We are uh, applying the standards that are applicable to the jurisdiction in which uh, the project is. Okay, thank you for that. That's that's clear. Next question: Why not start phase one at the Credit Woodlands and run east? Uh, did the planners and councillors and consultants consider starting the median lanes at the Credit Woodlands, where Dundas is six lanes wide, then running east? This would allow the median lanes to cover residential areas and industrial areas. There are already high occupancy vehicle lanes east of Dixie. I'm worried that the cost of widening through the pinch points means that money will run out, the project will see cost overruns, and the BRT median lanes won't have a phase two. Cost overruns happen way too often with transit infrastructure projects, and there's nothing to suggest Dundas will be an exception. So uh, would you like to respond to that, please? I can take care of that. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Uh, it's it's proposed to implement the Dundas BRT from uh, Etobicoke Creek at the Toronto border through to Cooksville at the current time because it does provide for that direct connection to the existing HOV lanes in Toronto. This, of course, is uh, tied to environmental assessment process and approvals as well as uh, funding commitments which have not been acquired at this time. Notwithstanding to the question that's asked, uh, there is six lanes east of the Credit Woodlands through a lot of that segment past Mavis. Um, but it's not a straightforward and simple task to simply convert that lane space for the BRT guideway. There's a fair amount of construction involved. Uh, you have to reconstruct the road, you have to build the guideway, you have to build medians, the BRT stops and platforms, all that tra transit signal priority infrastructure, uh, reconstructing the boulevards, relocating utilities, uh, property if there's impacts there. Uh, so there's a lot of impact that's, or, or a lot of construction and costs associated with that. And these uh, additional costs are, are not definitely not in place at this time and they're not part of the city's federal infrastructure uh, investing in Canada infrastructure funding request um, that ICEP funding request is for the segment from Etobicoke Creek through to Cooksville only 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question I'm going to skip over. That's the turning lanes, and you spent quite a bit of time in the presentation with the uh, with the slide and the diagram, of course, and and you provided that information. Uh, and I, I uh, this presentation, by the way, is available for download for anybody who wants to go and look at that, and you'll be able to watch it again tomorrow. Let's go on to the next question, which is electric buses. Will the BRT use electric vehicles such as battery electric buses or even trolley buses? Sure, I'll take this one. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so at this point, we haven't determined what vehicles will operate um, on the Dundas BRT. Um, it will depend on a few factors, um, including public feedback, um, the the ultimate um, routing of the services, um, the fleet requirements, and the service provider. Um, however, there are ongoing um, future technology pilot projects taking place um, within the region to test and evaluate benefits, um, including MyWay, uh, which is participating in a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus project. Um, the scope of this study, however, is to consider provisions for these future technologies um, to ensure that the infrastructure is able to accommodate these technologies. Um, so, so we're going to we're going to um, you know protect and not preclude um, you know future electric bus technology. Thank you very much for that, Joseph. Uh, community benefits programming has has a community benefits program. Uh, has been associated with uh, transit projects elsewhere. And the question is, will you create one for this to promote jobs, economic and social inclusion for low income marginalized communities uh, within the area? Yeah, Joseph, I can take that. Greg Madeline here. Um, to all those uh, to all those listening in, I think it's really important to share how important uh, just being an active member of the community is to Metrolinx. As, as, as it stands right now, we've got an, an, a corner office right out here, Ontario and Dundas, where we're integrated right into the community of Peel. And uh, it'll come to no surprise that community supports is something that Metrolinx looks at for all its projects. And a great one to, to consider a, an example would be the Here Ontario LRT project. We have a great working relationship with the Peel Community Benefits Network and also with Sheridan College to promote apprenticeships and training programs and opportunities. So while the project uh, here that we're talking about today is still a long way in terms of planning and operationalizing, I think it's something that the community could expect that we would be engaged with. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, next question uh, would be, um, you talked earlier about the right of way width, and there's a request that you compare the 42 meter ideal right of way to the rights of way that people might be familiar with for on St. Clair or Spadina. Is it possible for you? I, I think that the questioner yeah. wants to get a, a frame of, of reference mm -hmm. from a real life example. Yeah, I think I don't know, Kevin, if you if you have those numbers on the top of your head, but I think we might have to take that one back. Um, yeah. We're not necessarily familiar with um, okay. the existing right away widths on, on St. Clair. All right, but that's we can fair. certainly and get back to it. On that. Excellent. And I, I should say to people that Metrolinx uh, responds to the questions uh, in the days and week after the session in writing here. So you'll you'll have the recording tonight, but you'll also be able to come back and, and see answers for reference. So um, then let's move on to the uh, next one, which is, uh, will there be median BRT stations in the Mississauga West area? Um, from Confederation Parkway to Ninth Line. The right of way seems to be plenty wide with the exception of the Arendale Valley Park uh, area. And uh, the right of way west of Fifth Line is wide enough to accommodate median BRT lanes. So will there be BRT stations in that area? I can take this question, Joseph. Um, we will be identifying BRT stop and station locations in the future, but what I can relay is what was done in the prior Dundas Connects Corridor Transportation Master Plan by the City of Mississauga. They had identified a dedicated guideway 
uh, extending beyond Cooksville, as you're currently seeing in the plans today, through to the Credit Woodlands, and then uh, a median guideway, but a single lane reversible through Arendale Valley in recognition of those constraints that you just mentioned in the question because of the environmental sensitivity and the envir environmental heritage and the, uh, the uh, cultural heritage in that community. But then west of Mississauga Road and Arendale Village, it actually became a curbside uh, operation along the side of the street. Now, in I talked in my presentation about uh, a transit service and optioneering study that's going to be done in the next few months. Now, that transit service plan and study will investigate the type of facility will be further west and also for the Toronto section as well. So it, with that, we'll be confirming what type of guideway, if it's a guideway in the median, whether it's curbside, and where those stop locations will be. Thank you very much for that. Um, a couple questions came in at the same minute. Uh, you must have been addressing this in your presentation. Uh, when do you believe the construction will begin, and when will it be completed so a beginning and an ending to the active construction phase are you able to to just provide that information here matthew at the city would you like to address that or would you like me to uh, i can make a few comments uh, for for most of the corridor i don't think there's any committed funding this the environmental assessment looks at at those impacts and, and what would be required to implement the project for the submission that we made to the federal government for funding of of the mississauga East section, um, the the uh, the program itself that we've applied to requires that the project would be done by 2027, and it would probably take about three years to construct. So, um, if we were successful in getting that funding, uh, the construction would occur uh, between uh, roughly 2024 and 2027. Okay, thank you very much for that. Next question is, why not have the local and express buses share the Cooksville BRT lanes? Uh, why not considering have my local and my express buses share the median BRT lanes through Cooksville? This would make the widening less needed because the buses would be relocated to the median lanes. It could potentially help save money to ensure the project will run to the Confederation Parkway and beyond as there's less risk of money running out. The difference might be that there have to be a couple more stations in Cooksville and buses might be a tiny bit slower, but it would be better for residents to have stations closer to their homes. So uh, are you able to talk about running both local and express uh, on the right of way, please? Uh, maybe maybe I'll start um, by sort of talking about the the routing and service strategy um, and sort of broader broader concept of operations. Um, those are both work streams that we are currently working on that um, are going to be inputs into the um, broader preliminary design business case um, that will be uh, coming out in the future. Um, so you, you'll you'll certainly hear more about um, those those strategies um, in in the future. Um, we're looking at options for the entire corridor, um, including considering a local service overlay. Um, and during future public engagement, um, we will certainly um, be sharing those details. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, is there any plan to compensate the businesses along the route for lost business during construction? Metrolinks want to yeah. address that for the city? I mean, from the city perspective, uh, we haven't uh, secured funding to actually implement this project yet. Um, so I think it would, it would um, I don't know if Metrolinks has, has a position on, on the projects that they do, but I'm not aware of any uh, direct compensation that, that occurs unless there's uh, you know, uh, property requirements and those type of things. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, again, to echo, echo uh, Matthew's uh, comments, uh, still very early days, obviously, in this project, but I think it, it's something uh, that would be a comparable, like um, like other Metrolinx projects, would it be something we would look at, like the Eglinton Crosstown. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but at what point would that likely be looked at in, in the project if the business community wanted to talk to you at the right time about, about that? Uh, when would that be? Yeah, I, I think you know we're in we're in PIC three right now, and we have a couple of other uh, signature engagements still. Joseph, I think uh, along the way, the time is now to ask questions like that, and then as the project, as the TPAP portion of the study moves on, I think there would be more dialogue as it relates to that. Okay, and business, if they want to get themselves on a list and or contact you, there's a contact form that's right here at the top of this page, and I'm assuming they could simply use that contact form to let you know that they'd like to talk to you at the appropriate time. I think that's the so. perfect, perfect way to do that, Joseph, and it would be very helpful for us to see themes from people as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So, um, we, we you talked about uh, the impact uh, changes on on the uh, surrounding area. There's a question about who will be involved in analyzing, uh, conducting further analysis and analyzing uh, the impact on birds, the archaeological and heritage uh, impacts. Um, can you give a bit more information about who is involved in that analysis, please? I, I can take this one if Kevin, if you oh, perfect, the environmental sure. person. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Darcy. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to for, just first clarify. Um, ACOMS already completed um, technical environmental studies for this project. This includes a natural environment report. Um, so they did look at bird species present in the corridor, um, a stage one archaeological assessment, uh, and a cultural heritage report um, for the entire corridor. Um, the stage one archaeological assessment recommended a stage two archaeological assessment be done um, in the, during the detailed design phase. Um, and the cultural heritage report recommended that uh, evaluation reports be undertaken um, for properties that we anticipate may be directly impacted. Um, so a summary of the results of these studies are available on the project website and, and in this presentation as well. Um, specifically, this includes anticipated impacts as well as mitigation measures that the team proposes. Um, so we are looking for comments on these anticipated impacts, uh, as well as the proposed mitigation measures. Comments uh, can be provided on the Metrolinx Engage website. Uh, might be the easiest way to provide those comments. Um, and then the full uh, detailed impacts and mitigation table um, and, and the technical reports themselves um, will be made publicly available as part of the EPR. Um, which will be posted on the project website uh, from February 23rd to March 24th. This is the 30-day public review period that's been mentioned uh, during this presentation. And comments uh, during that time can be provided to Metrolinx. Um, and if there's any objections at that time, those can be provided to the Minister of the Environment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Thank you for that. Your answers are clearly providing a lot of information because we're getting a lot of questions during the uh, during this session. So, uh, and what I'm trying to do is, as I see certain ones being voted up, I'm trying to take those uh, uh, first. So, let me just go on to the next one, and it is dealing with the uh, with Cothra. Uh, what will you do with the overpass east of just west of Cothra Road? It is narrow. Yeah, I can take that one, Joseph. Yes, it, it is narrow. Um, in order to accommodate the the, the Dundas BRT uh, cross section or corridor design, that structure will either need to be widened or it will need to be um, replaced with a wider structure. Um, unfortunately, due to the condition of the structure as well as um, as well as the structure type, the current recommendation is for that structure to be replaced, or at least the superstructure, the part you see above the ground, be replaced and uh, with a wider cross section to accommodate the BRT and the the active transportation and enhance Boulevard through that area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we we talked earlier about the left turns. 
Um, there's a question here about U-turn education. Um, how do you plan to educate drivers in regards to the left-hand turn lanes and the use of U-turns? Mississaugans are not used to this, and are and and I'm concerned with driver and pedestrian safety. So here's someone looking ahead to to the actual uh, usage and how you can get people who are driving through the area to understand this new traffic pattern. I can take that, Joseph. It's it that would be part of the deliverability and implementation planning that we'll do in the future. Um, it, so it's not done yet, but I, I mean, Mississaugans, if they can drive and um, they they deserve really good credit. They're good drivers. But that said, you know, there's signage. There'll be uh, education signage, advanced notice about the project. Certainly the project would be obvious because it'll be in construction. Uh, so there will be an implementation plan that will be drafted for this. Okay. And, and I might just ask uh, as a supplement uh, spontaneously, this kind of arrangement that you're proposing with the uh, U-turns, the extra length on the lights to allow for that, um, is this something that's in practice in other BRTs uh, or is this a brand new initiative that will be tried first in Mississauga? No, this is fairly typical traffic signal cycle phasing practice. If you have more left turns or U-turns at an intersection, just providing more green time for the left turn. Sure, that comes at the expense of other signal phases there. You might have to reduce the side street traffic green, uh, but there's an optimization balance that our traffic engineering teams would do to optimize the signal operations and the level of service and reduce delays. Okay. Okay, thank you. Now, this is probably related. Um, what about transport trucks? Uh, how do they fit into these plans? Have you considered transport truck traffic um, in this area? Uh, it, it, this isn't... Uh, I I wouldn't advocate for Dundas Street to being a, a corridor means of, of freight traffic. That all said, you know, Dundas Street does provide access to businesses in the area, moving trucks and the like. And, and this kind of dovetails back to, I think it was the very first question of why not all the lanes are getting back, to, narrowed up, assuming uh, down to 3.35 meters. 3.5 meter wide lanes provide for a little bit more maneuvering space for those oversized vehicles, whether they be heavy vehicles and trucks uh, or even buses because as we've heard already there would be a local bus service overlay and those local buses would be in the curbside lanes so they're a bigger vehicle than your traditional automobile but it's reflected in our design okay thank you and another design question when you were going through the slides uh one questioner uh observed is and that it appeared that platforms are only shown on one side at major intersections and the cross sections. Um, are pedestrian boarding areas intended for both directions? Uh, maybe Daniel, if you could just go back to the, there was a concept rendering that Andrew was showing. Um, I guess slide 35. If you can throw that on screen, but what I'll try and do is describe it while we wait. There you go. Okay. So that actually has platforms on both sides of the intersection, but the far side intersection uh, uh, stop is just on the other side of the zebra crossing markings. So there would be at all the intersections a stop on both sides. Right. It's not like here, right. Ontario, the here, Ontario LRT, and maybe the questioner is thinking about that for the here, Ontario LRT at Dundas Street. The stop is actually both uh, northbound and southbound is on the south side of the intersection. And so it's a common platform where either northbound and southbound passengers would alight board on that one spot. But in, in the case of this, it'll be uh, stops on either side of the on both sides of the intersection. Okay, thank you. They're just staggered one uh, on the opposite side, uh, presumably so that the buses aren't stopped for a red light. Uh, they can go through uh, on a green and then pick up people on the other side. 
Yeah, a good, yeah. Um, okay. a great reference project to look at would be Highway 7 and Viva through York Region, much of York Region, uh, Young Street, um, north of Richmond Hill through to Newmarket, uh, and even Davis Drive in the Newmarket area. Okay. Um, people use GO trains, uh, and there's a question about GO station connections. How will GO station connections at Dixie and here Ontario Street be made? Uh, will people be expected to walk the distance so around eight to 10 minutes, or will buses go into the stations? Sure, I'll take this question. Um, this this is again all being considered as part of the routing and service plan um which is again an active piece of work underway um i think it would be useful to point people to the initial business case that we had produced um, and published uh recently um which is on the metrolinks website if you go to the metrolinks website and look for business cases you'll find the dundas initial business case um which shows um some preliminary routing and service concepts um including uh not just focusing on the uh, Dundas corridor itself, but looking at services that connect to a lot of important destinations um, near the corridor, um, whether it's GO stations, uh, University of Toronto, um, Mississauga, um, and uh, Square One. So, so we're we're sort of considering not just the corridor itself and looking at uh, services that are going to serve the corridor, but also looking at the major origins and destinations for customers that will be using the corridor. Okay, thank you. Um, we've reached our the end of our schedule time, but um, if it's okay with the panelists, we'll go a bit over so we can fit in a few more questions that have come in. Um, is that okay with with you folks? Can you stay for a bit? That's great, Joseph. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, here's a question about um, stops. Uh, where are you planning to put stops between Camilla and Cothra? Don't know whether you've reached that point in planning, but uh, can you talk about where the stops might be located, please? Andrew, do you um, have that? There's uh, eight stops that have been identified. And Andrew, while I speak to the placing guidelines yeah. that we've got in place for that, maybe you can just pull up the list yeah, for the eight stops. That. And uh, so in general, the placement of stops is based on providing for, uh, a, well, they're a little bit wider than your local, uh, local bus service, as we heard in a question earlier. Local buses tend to be in the 250 to 400 meter at most uh, for spacing. But in terms of BRT, in order to maintain the efficiency and the, the, that promptness, the quickness of a, a BRT bus, you want to have farther spacing of the, the BRT stops uh, so that they don't stop as often. And that provides that quicker service and, you know, how we got that 20 time, 20 minute uh, travel time savings that I was talking about in our presentation. Uh, so based on, you know, you know, generous spacing of the stops, as well as looking at major uh, generators in the area and connection points along Dundas Street, we did identify eight uh, BRT stop locations and Andrew do you have that list up now yeah. that you can just run through yeah for sure um, so some going from west to east so through the Cooksville area um, currently we're proposing a, a stop at Confederation Parkway and then obviously one at here Ontario Street um, the next uh, stop within Cooksville would be at the Kerwin Avenue or Camilla Road intersection and then uh, Grenville Drive or Cliff Road, Cothra Road, Tompkin Road, Dixie, and uh, Wharton Way. So those those would be the eight stops that are currently um, being proposed. Okay, thank you. Let Let's stay with stops for a second and and talk about the design of the stops. Uh, will station designs ensure riders are protected from the weather? Uh, the commenter uh, suggests that Dundas BRT riders should not be exposed to splashing from cars or buses, and station canopies should be should protect the platforms. Platforms should be built with snow melting systems to reduce salt use for melting snow, especially in areas where the BRT crosses sensitive watersheds like uh, Tobacco Creek, Little Tobacco Creek, and Cooksville Creek in Mississauga East. So can you talk a bit about the station designs and how they will both uh, protect people but also uh, protect the environment? 
uh, sure. I think I'll, I'll speak to the design process and maybe we can invite uh, Darcy or Joanne to speak on the environmental side of things. But in terms of the design, uh, that's being developed and it's being developed with uh, Metrolinx's Design Excellence Program. Uh, but in terms of the amenities that are being considered, and I think we spoke to it at our last public engagement, uh, climate protection, so enclosure uh, of the space is being considered. Uh, a number of uh, amenities that uh, at the stop would be fair collection, uh, you know, your presto, uh, uh, next bus information, uh, there would be, you know, seating and receptacles uh, for waste collection, that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and the stops would also be, you know, reflect the heritage or the community uh, characteristics in that particular node along the corridor. Uh, Darcy, did you want to speak to anything on the natural environment and protection or how we would manage through that? Sure. I, I can just add that um, Metrolinx has a sustainable design standard um, for all new um, construction. Um, and one of, the, one of the goals includes monitoring salt use. Of, um, so this, this would apply at, at any new Metrolinx facilities where salt use would be monitored uh, to ensure that um, there isn't more salt being used uh, than needed because as this commenter mentioned, um, you know, too much salt can have impacts on the natural environment. Thank you for that. Um, here's a quite a different question. Um, will this be a P3 procurement contract or bid build? Um, so I, I know that's probably not the kind of thing that the general public asks for, but I'll ask you here because for transparency and and public knowledge, you may just want to indicate what you have in plan. So have you decided P3 procurement or bid build? Uh, um, Matt, I'll... Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Also, actually, <laughs> Emery um, is probably the best person uh, to answer, so I'll let her start. Yeah, at this point in time for the entire corridor, the procurement uh, mechanism has not been determined yet. As we mentioned, you know, the funding for the delivery piece uh, has not been secured. So it is something that will be considered in the later uh, parts of this project. Okay, thank you. Um, I love these crisp answers. Uh, we've got three more questions and then I'll let you go. Fares. Uh, what fare would the Dundas BRT be under? Hamilton Street Railway, My Way, TTC, or uh, would we expect to see full fare integration at some point? Uh, if that's a. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we. This is still something that's that's under consideration. There's there's a whole concept of operations um, work stream that I talked about earlier. Um, that's that's in development. Um, I think uh, fair would certainly be part of that conversation as well. Um, Anne Marie, do you have anything to add? Yeah. So in addition to all of that, I know there is also just. Uh, fair and service integration, like as a separate stream of work that's happening at Metrolinx. Um, we do recognize, especially for BRTs that are, you know, cross boundaries and cross municipalities that, um, you know, obviously we want to uh, work towards a more efficient, fair system and structure with municipalities. So that's definitely something that's on our radar um, and a separate stream of work happening in conjunction with Metrolinx and its partners. Okay, thank you. Another question that was asked is, uh, have you studied, can you project what will happen to property values uh, for people who live close to Dundas? But any forecast about uh, what people should be expecting? Will it be a positive, a negative? Is there any knowledge about that? I can, uh, I'll jump in on this briefly. Uh, I'm not an economics uh, okay. and property person, but I'm an engineer and transportation planner. Um, it, it, this project is an investment in the community and uh, it, it's meant to unlock 
uh, the ability to move more people in the area. And with moving more people, it just becomes more of an attractive community. And so with that, I would speculate, again, as an engineer, not an economics uh, person, that there would be uh, a, you know, a, a change in uh, property values. Okay. I'll just add, I'll just add yes. to that. Yeah. Like land value uplift is something that at Metrolinx, um, at least uh, from various projects, have been something that we've been considering looking into. I know for this project, we haven't done so at this point in time. Um, so it's something that we could take back. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, final question uh, Do you consider LRT technology in your business case? The uh, I could take. Oh, sir. <laughs> um, so it, it certainly uh, depends on the project. We've done you know business cases on BRTs. We've done business cases on subways. We've done uh, business cases on LRTs. Um, it there there are a lot of factors um, that go into determining sort of what what the appropriate modes of study is, um, and and it varies by project. Um, we we use the regional transportation plan, um, which is also on our website um, for for everyone to read. Um, as sort of the the guide um, for for the products we study, um, the regional transportation plan tends to make sort of high high level recommendations for various quarters about uh, you know what what the appropriate mode would be for the quarter based on on various factors, um, including uh, nature of the corridor, uh, projected ridership, um, and sort of sort of those kinds of things. Um, so so the answer is yes, we do business cases on on LRTs um, for this particular project. Um, we've we've been looking at BRT um, due to the just the, the nature of the right of way itself and the flexibility that BRT allows us um, to operate over a uh, 48 kilometer corridor, both on the corridor as well as uh, connecting to destinations um, near the corridor as well. Well, and thank you for that. And thank you to all of the panel for uh, your responses. Uh, and thank you to everybody who came tonight. Uh, at the beginning, before the session, we had three questions and obviously we have a lot more questions. There was a, clearly, uh, you are engaged in this project in your community. Um, there will be other opportunities uh, for input and to inform yourselves. This is just one incident along the way. It's not the end. Um, you can download tonight's presentation if you want to review it at length, and we'll leave the questions open for a period of time so that if you want to add a question and Metrolink staff will review it, there's also right under where you download uh, the presentation, there's a survey, a phase three survey that you can complete as well and provide your views on those questions. So thank you to everybody for participating and please stay safe. Please stay well. Good night.